All right, uh, first an announcement. Uh, there will be no class in person on Friday. Um, I'm gonna be heading out of town Thursday night. There will still be a video to watch, a lecture from fall 2019 instead. You can watch that before Friday if you want. You can also watch it, and I will post it on Moodle. You can also watch it after spring break if you want. It's up to you, whatever you think might be most helpful for you. There will be an assignment still due on Friday uh, that you will all be uh, either putting into my box outside my office door, the bottom slot, or if you have to be distanced, those who are distanced, you can email it to me, but those who are in person or who are able to be here in person, you should give the hard copy. Again, the bottom slot outside my office door by class time on Friday, so that would be by 1230 on Friday. If you wanna leave uh, town early, then get it done early so you can get it in. Um, after spring break, there will be an assignment due, but I will give you a little bit of an extension. It won't be due on the Monday that when you come back at class, but it'll be due on the Tuesday morning at my office. So a little bit of a cushion. You could certainly work on it before spring break if you want. You can certainly also wait until after spring break if you want. Another announcement is we are now at the point where we are starting to get into the derivative rules in chapter three, and that means gateway exam on derivative taking will be coming up shortly after the end of spring break. Leading up to that gateway exam, I, I will be giving some in-class quizzes on taking derivatives. And remember what the gateway is, is it's a test about taking derivatives and just getting the exact right answer. There's no partial credit. You gotta get six out of seven exactly right for passing, but you do get more than one chance to pass. However, I should warn you that the different versions of the gateway are not all the same. Okay, they are different problems. So even though you get more than one chance to pass, it's not the exact same problems you got before. It's a different list of seven problems. You got to get six out of seven exactly right to pass. Okay, so make sure we are working on that. And the quizzes will lead up to hopefully most people passing. Question? Um, the gateway exam only affects your grade. Now, back 25 years ago, the department's policy with gateway was more strict. And if you failed the gateway, what it meant is you failed the course and you could not go into the next course. Now we just have a point deduction. And to tell you the truth, I forgot what the point deduction is. It might be a letter grade. Uh, that's still extreme because so it's still important to pass. You still need to study, but it's not as much of a penalty as before. You can still pass the course without passing the gateway. Like I said, I'll give you some quizzes, not the Monday when you come back, but probably starting that Wednesday, leading up to the gateway where you'll be practicing for the gateway, practice taking derivatives. On the quizzes, you can get partial credit, but on the gateway, it's all or nothing on each prop. <clears throat> we'll talk about that more as we come back after spring break. Also after spring break, we'll get going on the first project that will involve using Mathematica. So that's why we wanna continue working at using Mathematica and understanding it. For this first project, I have also made some extra videos to help you with the Mathematica. I made these videos about five years ago or so. And that will, the purpose is to help you with that project and to help you with Mathematica, something else to work on. I will lighten the homework load, the regular homework load, be fewer problems as you work on the problems, as, as you work on the project. There still will be regular homework, homework. It'll just probably be fewer problems or at least shorter problems in general. All right, today, uh, the goal is to do as many derivative facts as we can, not really justifying these facts for the most part, except perhaps intuitively a little bit and relying on Mathematica to double check our work as many derivative facts as we can, start practice, practicing taking derivatives. So we'll take derivatives of polynomials. We'll also take derivatives of exponential functions, modifications of exponential functions, like for example, instead of e to the two x, maybe, instead of e to the x, maybe e to the two x, or four times e to the three x, or maybe two to the x, instead of e to the x. I think I will talk about derivatives of cosine and sine as well. 
even though that's not in the reading yet. And some rules, linearity I've already talked about, but also there's something called the product rule and the quotient rule that will start getting some practice using and maybe even the chain rule a little bit today. So lots of important things today. You wanna to make sure you're really paying attention well. And if you're watching on YouTube afterwards, take, make sure you're paying attention well for your participation. It's your notes again, and we'll work on Mathematica. So you should open Mathematica up now if you haven't yet. We will be doing both graphs and computations on Mathematica. And probably some manipulations to try to visualize things and think physically about what we're seeing here. Okay. So let's start first with a polynomial example. And so I'm going to go ahead and start entering it into Mathematica. <clears throat> The last polynomial example, what we did, we entered in factored form so that we knew what the intercepts were. This time, let's enter it in expanded form, standard form. <clears throat> it will not be clear what the inter intercepts might be, but that's okay. Sometimes that's what happens. Let's make it a cubic. Um, I'll make it t cubed uh, plus 2t squared minus 5t. Uh, let's go minus one. Actually, actually, it makes it. Let's make it plus one. Okay. So this is my cubic. That is going to. Let's go ahead and pretend we got our standard kind of application. Let's pretend this is a function that represents your position at any moment in time, say in meters, where t is in seconds. Our standard kind of example. Enter the function like that. The semicolon just suppresses the output. I didn't really need it there, but I kind of like to have it. It's entered now. If I type f of t and hit shift return, I do see the function is there. I could clear it out of the memory, but I don't want to. In all likelihood, the roots of this, the t intercepts, if the horizontal axis is t, the times when it equals zero are probably irrational numbers. Since I made up the coefficients here, sort of randomly on the spot, in all likelihood, those roots are irrational numbers. If I want to see approximately what they are, I think n solve will probably do it for me. Let's just see what happens. So you'd want to type this capital N, capital S, O L V E. N solve is a numerical equation solver. Square brackets, n square brackets. Remember, this is good coding practice to put the beginning square bracket and ending square bracket right away. Inside, we want to put the equation we're trying to solve. Where is f of t equal to zero? I can do it this way. Do make sure you put double equal signs like I did. If you put a single equal sign, it'll mess things up. All right. When you're using n solve to solve equations, there are other equation solvers. One's just plain solve. There's another one called find root. N solve approximates answers, including irrational answers based on a certain method. Then put a comma, then a T. You got to put the double equal sign. In. Enter this. And yes, it does give us three real roots. These are approximate roots. They're not exact. In all, like I said, in all likelihood, the real roots of this are irrational numbers. Let's go ahead and plot it <clears throat> to show all the roots. So I'll let t go from say negative, oh, negative four to four. This syntax will give us a basic plot. There it is. Typically you start your time intervals if you're letting this model some kind of motion at time zero, that's just the most natural thing to do. But in reality, you don't actually have to stop to start it at time zero. You could imagine time starting at time negative four. Okay, that would be a strange thing to do, but there's really nothing stopping you. I would now like to start time at negative four and imagine this is representing a position of an object as it moves. And like I showed you last time, I'm going to represent that position on the vertical axis. So what that means is I want to show this plot with a plot of a dot that moves on the vertical axis as time goes by. 
Okay, so this is, gets, gets tricky. Watch what I do here. Watch the way I do this. First, I'm gonna use show. What does show do? Show combines graphics into one picture. One of the graph is gonna be, one of the graphs is gonna be the graph that you see here. Although I'm gonna animate it, I'm gonna see it be traced out as time goes by. So I'm gonna show that plot. I'm gonna put a plot inside here. What goes inside the plot? This exact same function, f of t, comma, t goes from negative four up to, I'm gonna call it capital T. Capital T is gonna be what I'm gonna use for my animation parameter, you might call it. It's gonna represent time going by in the manipulate animation. It's gonna be a slider that I see when I enter this code ultimately, and that I'm gonna let the slider run to see the animation happen. By plotting from negative four to capital T, that's going to make the graph get plotted out as your calculator would show if you plotted this function in your calculator. You don't see the finished product in your calculator, you see it get traced out. After the plot, but still inside the show, put a comma. And now I'm gonna put that list plot command that is gonna plot the dot. Capital L, capital P, put square brackets like I just showed you there to make sure that you put that ending square bracket. By doing this, you're avoiding mistakes. How do I plot a dot on the axis? If it's on the vertical axis, its first coordinate is zero. And if it's representing the position of the object as a function of time, its second coordinate better be f of t. Here's the syntax. Curly brace, curly brace, zero comma f of capital T. N curly brace, n curly brace. Effectively, this represents a point on the vertical axis because the first coordinate is zero and the second coordinate is f of t. And yes, it will move as capital T changes because capital T is again, the animation parameter that will change as the animation happens. This should work. Now it's not gonna be ideal. To make it a little bit more ideal, I wanna add another comma after the list plot and put my plot range command in there to make sure that my plotting window stays constant. That'll make it as nice as possible. So plot range with a capital P and a capital R. Arrow, you make the arrow again by a minus sign and a greater than sign. And I'm gonna put not just one list to give me the Y direction, but two lists to give me both the horizontal T direction and the vertical Y direction. And the syntax is curly brace, curly brace, say negative four to four for the horizontal direction and curly brace, comma, another curly brace, say negative oh, 15 to 30, oh, let's go up to 40, and curly brace, and curly brace. You wanna make sure you type it in exactly like you see there. And again, the arrow comes from making a minus, typing a minus sign, then a greater than sign. So take the time to take 10 seconds here to double check that you typed exactly like you see here. Now, if I enter this, it's not gonna do anything as is because I haven't specified what capital T is. So if I go ahead and enter it, I won't get an error, but I don't, well, okay, I guess it did give me an error. <clears throat> Um, but it didn't really do anything. It didn't do what I wanted. The reason is because I haven't put it inside the manipulate yet. So I'm gonna take this whole thing essentially and put it inside a manipulate. I'm gonna go ahead and type manipulate with a capital M square bracket. Then over here, put the M square bracket. And then I see the little red carrot there, put a comma. By putting all this inside a manipulate, this whole thing that I typed before right there. And then in the manipulate, after the comma, putting capital T in curly braces and letting Mathematica know what range of values I want cap capital T to go over, I will create an animation. That is the kind of animation that I want. Capital T goes from say just barely bigger than negative four, like negative 3.999 up to positive four. I don't wanna do negative four because that gives an error because then it tries plotting from negative four to four and it says, I can't do that. 
Now, if I enter this, there should hopefully be no errors. Yep. And I get this window. I can play T and I see the graph getting traced out. It's moving the axis, which I don't like. I can fix that by going back up here and after this curly brace, brace after the plot range, put axes origin with a capital A and a capital O, arrow zero, zero inside curly braces. That'll keep the origin where it should be, which will also keep the axes where it sh they should be. Okay, and now I have the animation that I want. And this is really important to think about, okay? Think physically about this physically. Think about the dot as being a bug traveling back and forth along the Y axis there. What this function is, is giving us the position of the bug. Let's slow it down here so we can see things easier. It's giving us the position, the vertical position of the bug on that axis as a function of time. Notice that when the graph of F is increasing, the bug is moving upward, like right now. And when the graph of F is decreasing, the bug is moving downward. It turned around at the moment when F had a little local maximum there, a little peak. And then it's gonna turn around again right now and go back in the positive direction. So it's very important, first of all, to understand that when this function, <clears throat> this position function is increasing, when its derivative is positive, that means the bug is traveling upward. And when this function is decreasing, like right now, when its derivative is negative, the, graph, the uh, function, the bug is traveling downward. Okay, and then back upward again. There's more subtle information going on as well. <clears throat> sometimes the bug travels pretty fast, sometimes it travels pretty slow. Anytime it's changing direction, like right now, it's pretty slow. Anytime it's not changing direction, and if the graph is fairly steep, it's going fairly fast, but now it's going slow again. I hope your video is able to keep up with me here, okay? Do the screen share on Zoom. Now it's traveling fast. When the graph is steep, it's traveling fast, like now, and then it's slowing down, turning around, going faster, but in the negative direction, negative velocity, slowing down, now turning around again, going slow in the positive direction. The velocity keeps increasing faster and faster. The acceleration is positive there. And that's related to the first and second derivative. The first derivative is velocity. The second derivative is the acceleration. I'll let this keep running here. What is this function again? Let's do this by hand. Let's calculate the derivative by hand. The function is f of t equals t cubed plus 2t squared minus 5t plus 1. What is its velocity? So that's its position. S, if you like. Again, S seems like a strange letter to use for position, but it is standard because it makes you think speed, but it's, it's not its position. The derivative we'd call V because it stands for velocity. With prime notation, we write it as F prime of T. With Leibniz notation, we write it as ds dt. You should be completely comfortable either way you write it. They both have their benefits. Writing it as F prime of T emphasizes it's a function of T. And in fact, it also emphasizes it is, that it's a function derived from F itself. That's why we call it derivative, because we're deriving it from F itself. It's a function of T. I can graph it. I will graph it. DS dt emphasizes that it's a rate of change an instantaneous rate of change. This is analogous to delta S over delta T, analogous to a change in position divided by a change in time, analogous to an average velocity, but now it's an instantaneous velocity. We imagine, if you do watch the lectures, you'll see I talk about this a lot. We imagine DS and DT as being tiny changes in position and tiny changes in time. And we'd have a bunch of them as time goes by. 
So even though it's not technically a ratio, it's not really change in position divided by change in time, it doesn't hurt to often pretend it is. And this pretending, it sounds weird to pretend, but it really is helpful. I always got confused, right? That's a, it's a confusing thing to pretend that. My calculus teacher would tell me, oh, this is not a fraction, it's based on limits. But then in my physics classes, they would pretend it's a fraction. And I'd, like, I'd be like, well, how do you know you can do that? And the physicist would say, well, what are you, a mathematician? They, do it, they say they can do it just because it makes sense. They may not be able to rigorously define it. Some of them can, but they think about it intuitively and there's benefits to that because it emphasizes the rate of change. It emphasizes the units meters per second in this case, but it could be positive. It could be negative depending on the direction of motion. Thinking about actually doing the de derivative here, thinking about linearity, I'm not gonna go ahead and write out all the steps. Just think about it with me. I first need to differentiate t cubed with respect to t. That gives me 3t squared. That's the power rule. Add two times the derivative of t squared. The derivative of t squared is 2t. Two times two is four. So I get plus 4t. Minus five times the derivative of t. The derivative of t is one. So it's minus five times one, just minus five plus the derivative of one, which is zero. One's a constant. There's your velocity function. Let's put that in the plot as well. I can go back up here and inside the plot right there, not only put the f of t, but also f prime of t, but to make sure it doesn't make a mistake, I need to start with a curly brace and then put a comma f prime of t and then n curly brace. If you don't use the curly braces, then it gives you an error. That'll plot both the position and the velocity as functions of time colored differently. The blue dot is still the location of the bug. The blue graph is still its position, but the goldish graph is now its velocity. Notice, right? Now, for example, the velocity is positive. The, blue the gold graph is positive. The blue graph goes up. Now it changes to a negative velocity. And the blue graph is going down. A maximum negative velocity when t is about negative 0.5. And then it turns around again, and the velocity becomes positive. That gold graph equals 0, like right here at about negative 2.1 or something. When the, blue, when the blue graph has a horizontal tangent line, a local maximum, that's a turning point for the bug as it moves. Another spot where the velocity is zero is coming up here soon when T is about um, right there, about 0.75 or 0.8 or so. That's when the bug turns around again, the velocity changes from negative to positive, the bug changes direction from moving in the negative direction to the positive direction. What about the acceleration? Acceleration A is F double prime of T. That is the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time. dv dt, it's the derivative of the derivative. It's also the, called the second derivative of the position with respect to time. And again, this is the notation you use for the second derivative. We take the derivative of the derivative. And now differentiate this thing, get, I hope you quickly see 6t plus four, a linear function. And we can plot it, go back up here, put another comma, put f double prime of t, enter it again, play it again, now we're going to see three graphs. The green one is now the acceleration. The acceleration here for this example is linear, straight line. It's negative when t is less than about negative 0.7 and then positive after that point. What does that mean? It means, well, now the bug is slowing down as it travels in the positive direction and speeding up as it travels in the negative direction until we get to right about there. That represents negative acceleration. When the bug was traveling in the positive direction and slowing down, 
or when it's traveling in the negative direction downward and speeding up, both represent negative acceleration. After T is about negative 0.6 here, then it's a positive acceleration. It is slowing down as it travels in the negative direction before it now speeds up as it travels in the positive direction. Super important to not only be able to do calculations, but to think about these graphs and what they tell you. To think about it physically, and yes, physics is a very important example of this kind of thinking you should be good at, even if you don't take physics, okay? It's very helpful thinking about these graphs and their relationships. Notice the green graph, the acceleration is zero right about there. That's where the velocity has a minimum. The green graph being the, the derivative of the derivative is negative when the gold graph has a negative slope, positive when the gold graph has a positive slope. Also, when the green graph is negative, the blue graph is concave down. Its slopes are decreasing. And then when the green graph is positive, the blue graph is concave up. Its slopes are increasing. All right, on tests, you should be able to handle not just symbolic problems, but also purely graphical problems. If I give you some graphs, for example, that maybe look like this, you should be able to identify which one is F, which one's F prime, and which one's F double prime, even if I don't give you formulas. Can I clarify anything that I've said here? Please let me know if, if you think you need clarification. Uh-huh. I just put an extra comma F double prime of T right there. Mm -hmm. Notice that the second derivative being linear is a pretty simple function. And it's pretty clearly important to know where that equals zero. And that's pretty easy to find as well, being a linear function. If I set this equal to zero and solve for t, that'll mean 6t is negative four and t is negative four six or negative two thirds, about negative 0.67. That is where the green graph crosses the axis at about negative 0.67, right about here, pretty close. That's where the blue graph changes concavity. The blue graph is said to have what's called an inflection point there, when it changes from concave down to concave up. It's also where the goldish graph, orangish graph, has a minimum, a low point, a minimized velocity, but it's a negative velocity. It's as low as it gets in the negative direction. It's where its slope is horizontal. It's tangent is horizontal. The derivative here is a quadratic function. I could figure out where that is zero as well, because whether I can, well, if I, even if I can't factor it, I can use the quadratic formula. If I set this equal to zero, set this equal to zero and solve for t, probably it's not easy to factor. Probably it's got irrational roots because I just made up the example on the spot with random coefficients. So in all likelihood, this is an irrational, this has irrational roots, but I can use the quadratic formula. Thinking about that quadratic formula, it's negative B, which in this case would be negative four, coefficient of T, plus or minus the square root of B squared, which would be four squared or 16, minus four times A is the coefficient of T squared, which is three, times C, which is the, co the constant term, which is negative five, all over two times a is two times three. Simplify a little bit. This part simplifies to negative two thirds, hmm, which happens to be the inflection point as well. Interesting. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not actually. Plus or minus, I'll write it as one six times the square root of four times three is 12 times five is 60 and the two negative signs make a plus. 60 plus 16 is 76. And yeah, 76 is not a perfect square. So this is these are irrational numbers here. You can write it as two fractions. You could also write it as one fraction, negative 
get a common denominator of six. Negative four plus or minus square root of 76 over six would be another way to write that. Uh, 76, you know, is 39 times two, which would be two times three times 13. You can't really simplify that. That doesn't involve a factor of a perfect square like four. Oh no, excuse me, it would involve four, wouldn't it? 38, okay, yeah. It's 19 times four. This can be simplified to uh, square root of four times square root of 38, which would be two square root of 38. So it can be simplified. That's not a real big deal to me if you do that or not. It's just something to know you can do. It's maybe helpful sometimes in simplifying things, but it's not a real big deal to me. You could also write the answer as uh, ultimately if you cancel one factor of two is negative two plus or minus square root of 38 over three if you cancel a factor of two in both the top and the bottom. And you could approximate these by looking at this graph here, these numbers should be close to negative 2.1 and positive 0.75 or 0.8 or so is what you should get. That's where the orangish graph is zero. That's where the blue graph has a turning point, a max and a min. All these things are super important, not just now in chapter three, but also when we do optimization in chapter four. You want to get this stuff right now. Of course, I say you want to get everything, but I mean, there certainly are some things that are, that are more important than others. This is pretty fundamental stuff. All right, let's go on to a new kind of example. Let's say our function, well, let's keep it simple. I'm going to copy and paste this down here. I highlighted the cell there. Did a control copy and then a control V here to paste it. I'm going to change the function to be e to the t. If you want it to be e to the t in Mathematica, you need to use a capital E, not a lowercase e. So now my function's e to the t instead of that, that cubic as before. Hmm, what is the derivative of b to the t? I'll just tell you the answer. It's e to the t. Mathematica is spitting back the answer in sort of with a fancy e, which also represents the number e. What? Wait, wait a minute. Is, is that right? Is the derivative of e to the t e to the t? Yes, it is. Amazing. The derivative with respect to time of e to the t is e to the t. That's why e is so important. Truthfully, that is. That is the reason e is so important. It's why we use it in calculus. It's why it's the most important base of an exponential function is because of that property right there. I've heard some professors say this is the most important fact in calculus. Do I agree? I'm not sure. But some professors say it. And fortunately, it's the easiest one to remember. And by the way, if the variable was x instead of t, you'd write it as the derivative with respect to x of e to the x is e to the x. Right? The variable name doesn't matter. It's the idea. When I write the ddx notation or the ddt notation, that's what I call the operator notation. It just means take the derivative with respect to whatever variable you're putting there of whatever's inside the parentheses. But wait, wait a minute, does this make sense graphically? I mean, if I do this plot here, if I graph f, f prime and f double prime, they're all gonna be the same, won't they? Yeah, they'll, be, they'll all be the same. In fact, yeah, since the first derivative of e to the t is e to the t, that must mean the second derivative of e to the t is e to the t. Because the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. That's a perfectly valid equation to write. And that also means the third derivative and the fourth derivative and the fifth derivative forever and ever of e to the t is itself. And so yeah, if I run this animation for e to the t, I'm only gonna get one graph. I guess colored green because the acceleration was the last one that's graphed. Can this represent a motion? Sure. 
It's a motion where the bug moves very, very slowly at first, and then all of a sudden speeds up really fast because that's the nature of exponential growth. Right, that function is not growing very fast when t is negative. So the bug is barely moving when t is negative. All of a sudden, when t gets past zero, it starts going really, really fast. Not only is its position increasing rapidly, but its velocity and acceleration are increasing very, very rapidly. It's not a proof that this, the derivative of e to the t is e to the t, but it helps you maybe believe it. And yeah, the second derivative of e to the t is e to the t still. And the third derivative and the fourth derivative and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, tenth derivative is still at e to the t. Fundamental derivative facts and the graphical and physical interpretations is what we're focusing on today. This is a fundamental fact. In fact, story you hear or I, I heard in the past is the professors who think this is the most important fact to know in calculus, an apocryphal story, which means it probably wasn't true about this was that one professor once put, made the final exam in his calculus class a one question final exam. And it was, what is the derivative of e to the t with respect to t? It's a trivial answer, it's e to the t, but imagine how nervous you would be if your final grade depended on that one question, you weren't positive that this was really right. But it is right, okay? Now that probably is not a true story, but it's a story we tell each other just to have a little joke, okay? Well, if the derivative of e to the t is e to the t, what's the derivative of e to the 2t, for example? But if I change this a little bit, copy and paste this down here and replace t with 2t like that, now what's the derivative? Is it e to the 2t? No, it's not. It's 2 times e to the 2t. And if I make my plot, I copy and paste this code down here. The graph of the position, velocity, and acceleration start looking pretty similar, but then they diverge from each other. They all have a similar shape. They all are like exponential growth, but they have different factors in front. Yeah, f of t is e to the t, 2t, f prime of t is 2e to the 2t, and f double prime is 4e to the 2t. By putting them in the list that way, I can just see them all at once. So while they're still exponential growth, they're not the exact same function now. The extra factor of two is affecting things. Is there a way to prove that the derivative of e to the 2t is 2e to the 2t based on this? Yeah. Do we have the tools to do such a proof yet? Mm, not without me telling you some new rules, but that's part of the point of what I want to do today as well. Let's say now f of t is e to the 2t. Oops, e to the 2t. To find the derivative of this, based on the fact that the derivative of e to the t is e to the t, there are a couple different ways you can think about it. I'm going to show you the non standard way to do it first. And then we'll think about the standard way. 2t is the same as t plus t. And by a property of exponents, that's the same as e to the t times e to the t, which I could also write as e to the t quantity squared if I like. But I want to write it like this. That's a product of two functions, both of which are e to the t, whose derivatives I know. Is there a rule for differentiating a product? Uh huh. It's called the product rule. Remember, we're not trying to fully justify these rules today. 
That's going to come after spring break. We'll try to justify these more. We're just getting these facts down and getting a little practice with them. The product rule says that in general, if you want to differentiate a function, let me go ahead and say it's a function of x, even though this is a function of t, of the product of two functions. I could name the functions anything I want. I think the book names them f and g. Since I already have an f, let me go ahead and use a g and an h. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> the symbols you use technically don't matter as long as you're staying consistent within the given equation. It's the idea that matters. <clears throat> so I've got the derivative of our product. Now remember that linearity rule that we talked about, I think first last Friday, and we've used today when we differentiated the polynomial said that the derivative of sum is the sum of the derivatives. And in fact, the derivative of difference was the difference of the derivatives. I also mentioned linear combinations in there where you've got coefficients. <clears throat> so you might guess that the derivative of a product, g of a, x times h of x, might be the product of the derivatives, g prime times h prime. And in fact, one of the early people who thought about calculus thought that was probably true, but then soon realized it was wrong. That's actually incorrect. Here's the way the product rule goes, and I'm not justifying this. I would encourage you to study the book to see the book's justification of this. I'm also going to assign um, three blue, one brown video or two in the coming, well, end of this week and maybe after spring break where they justify this. Think of this as the first function, and think of this as the second function. The way people often remember, remember the product rule is they say the derivative of a first times a second function is the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. Or because addition is commutative, you could also say that's the first function times the derivative of the second function plus the derivative of the first function times the second one. It doesn't matter which way you do it because addition can be done in either order. We're also going to talk about something called the quotient rule today, the derivative of a fraction, a division, a quotient, and their order matters because there's a subtraction involved. But here, because there's an addition, order doesn't matter. So either way you prefer to think about it is fine. Derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function or first function times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first times the second. Either way is fine. In the context of this problem, the first and second functions are the same. They're both e to the t. So the derivative of the first function times the second plus the first function times the derivative of the second, well, those derivatives, since it's e to the t, are all e to the t still. So you get e to the t times e to the t plus e to the t times e to the t. But now by rules of exponents, you add those exponents, that's e to the t plus t plus e to the t plus t. Careful about what, what things are plus signs and what things are t's here. That's the same as e to the 2t, or, yeah, e to the 2t plus e to the 2t, which is the same as 2 e to the 2t. Now that's a pretty long derivation of the answer. It is a correct derivation. Is there a quicker way to do it? Uh-huh, there is. There's another rule that is more commonly used here that is much quicker. 
But this rule is a little extra tricky. It's called the chain rule. I will talk about using the chain rule here right now, but I probably won't talk about it anymore the rest of the day today. Not sure if the lecture video I'll have you watch either Friday or after you come back from spring break involves it or not, but certainly after spring break, we'll talk more about the chain rule. The chain rule says, I'll go ahead and use a G and an H again. The derivative with respect to X, say, I could have used a T, of a composition G of H of X. Make sure you put all sets of parentheses here that you see. When you write the composition like this, remember we called H of X the inside function and G the outside function. The chain rule here says, take the derivative of the outside function, the G, plug in the inside function into that derivative, and then multiply that times the derivative of that inside function, H prime of X. Find the derivative of the outer function, G, plug in the inner function, H of X, into that derivative, whatever its formula is, then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. That looks kind of confusing, kind of tricky. How does it apply here? And, and how could it possibly be quicker when it looks more complicated, perhaps? You got to learn the right way to think about it. <clears throat> this f of t function here, e to the 2t, can be thought of as a composition. F of t equals e to the 2t, oops, e to the 2t, can be thought of as g of h of t for some function g and some function h. Actually, g and h are not unique, but there are natural things to pick. Remember you had a, a first exam question kind of like this? Find the g and the h function here. Most people got it right, but there were a few people who didn't. H of t is the inside function. It's what gets done first. When you plug a number into this formula, you multiply by two first. H of t is 2t, because that's what gets done first. Multiply by two. Then you take that number and you plug it into the e to the x function, you might say or g of t function, g of t is going to be e to the t. The chain rule down here involves, you, you need to find both g prime and h prime. So let's do so. h prime of t is just 2. g prime of t, since g of t is e to the t, is e to the t. So now use the chain rule. All right, so let's look at this. Let's be careful in using this now. I want f prime of t, which is the derivative with respect to t of this thing, g of h of t. By the chain rule, that is g prime of h of t times h prime of t the derivative of the outside function, plug in the inside function times the derivative of the inside function. G prime is e to the t. I've got to plug in h of t into that. h of t is 2t. So this is e to the 2t. Get that? That's the trickiest part right there that I just did. G prime is e to the t. I got to plug h of t into that. Replace t with 2t. See how important function notation is and understanding how, how to plug things in? Times h prime of t, which is 2. Hey, yeah, that's the answer, 2e to the 2t. That's the more common way to do it. When you get enough practice with this chain rule, 
which means a fair amount of practice. We're going to do a lot after spring break. You can get to the point where you can do this without writing out this equation. You can just write it out. People get good enough to, at this typically that they can do it in a few seconds. But this, if this is new to you, you're going to want to write it out first. Be extra careful about it. The way to get good at doing it quickly is to do exactly what I said in your mind. I'm taking the derivative of a composition with an inside function and an outside function. I take the derivative of the outside function, e to the t in this case, plug in the inside function, which is 2t, to give me e to the 2t, then differentiate the inside function, in this case, gives you 2. h prime of t is 2. Simplify. This is a lot of information to process today. Can't expect to get it just from listening to me. You've got to practice. Do another example that'll involve do it using yet another rule called the quotient rule. <clears throat> so again, we're just doing rules without explaining the rules. Let's say our f of t function is t divided by e to the t. Which you can also write as t times e to the negative t if you like. Either way is okay to write it. We're going to differentiate this two ways. One way we'll use the product rule plus that chain rule. And another way we'll use this new quotient rule that I haven't mentioned yet. There you've got a product. Let's do the product rule first. <clears throat> if I let's write it on a separate line here. If I think about this with the product rule, usually you wouldn't bother putting the dot in there. You usually write it as t is a negative t. It is a product of two functions. There's my first function, g of t. Here's my second function, h of t. The product rule says, take the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative of the second function. The derivative of the first function, g prime, g prime is just t, is one, right? Derivative of t with respect to t is one. It's a linear function, its slope is constant, one. h of t is still the speed of the negative t, plus g of t, which is t, times h prime of t. But how do you find h prime of t? It's e to the negative t here. What is h prime of t? I can use that chain rule again. Now I'm going to do it purely by thinking inside outside function, looking at this. Listen really carefully. When you plug a number into this function that's circled here, e to the negative t, what do you do first? Well, you negate it. You multiply it by negative one, that first. That's the inside function, negative t. The outside function is e to the t. I thought the inside function, the thing that gets done first is negating, multiplying by negative one, then exponentiating. The chain rule says, take the derivative of the outside function, which is e to the t, plug in the inside function, which is negative t. You plug negative t into e to the t, in place of t, you get e to the negative t again. Catch that? Say it again. If the outside function is e to the t, not bothering to write it down, the derivative of e to the t is e to the t, if I plug in the inside function into that, I re replace t with negative t, I get e to the negative t. 
Then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of negative t is negative one. With the previous example involving e to the 2t, we got 2e to the 2t. With this example, we get negative 1 times e to the negative t, or just negative e to the negative t. And that's what's going to go down here in place of h prime of t. Simplify, you can bring that negative sign out in front and write this as e to the negative t minus t e to the negative t. That is the derivative. This can be written in other ways. For example, it's useful to factor out a factor of e to the negative t. Why is that useful? It's always useful to, to factor derivatives and second derivatives if you can, because then it's easier to figure out where it equals zero. And we've already seen where, where derivatives are zero is important. In physics, it corresponds to, if the derivative is a velocity, it corresponds to velocity changing sign. And if the second derivative is an acceleration, it corresponds to the inflection point, the acceleration changing sign. Would be at t equals one here actually, and nowhere else would the derivative change sign. There's another way to get the answer. If we think about this as a quotient, the way I first wrote it, t divided by e to the t, because there's something called the quotient rule. Quotient rule, quotient stands for fraction or division. I'll write it with an x, d dx of f of x, uh, let's write g of x divided by h of x. Again, no explanations, just answers here today, because we're just after starting to get these rules into our hearts and minds. You want to practice these rules. You won't remember them if you don't practice them. The, the quotient rule says the derivative of a top function divided by a bottom function, you might say. Instead of first and second function, you've got top and bottom high and low, if you like. Here's how I remember it. It's another fraction where the top is, here's how I remember it. I say to myself, low d high minus high d low. What? Low, low d high minus? Low d high means derivative of the high function minus high d low means derivative of the bottom function. The d just stands for derivative. Low d high minus high d low. But it is a minus sign there, and so you cannot change around the order of those. A very common mistake, including on the gateway, where people get it wrong, is they switch these around. That's not the end, though. It's all over the square of what's below h of x quantity squared. Wow, that's kind of complicated but it is correct. <clears throat> low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below or the square of below. How does that work here? Coming back to this function, my g of t is the t and my h of t is the e to the t. So according to this quotient rule, using t as the variable instead of x. Low is e to the t. d high means derivative of the high function. Derivative of g of t is t is one. Minus high d low, derivative of e to the t is e to the t. Over the square of what's below. What's below, it's e to the t, I have to square that. Is it the same answer? Yes, though it doesn't really look like it, does it? How can I make the, how can I see that these two things are the same? They should be the same. Here's how I can factor out an e to the t on top, like this, and I can cancel it with one of the factors. I should say divide it out. That e to the t with one of those factors 
and I get one minus t over e to the t, but dividing by e to the t is the same as multiplying by e to the negative t. And that shows that I get the same answer as before. Just look different, okay? It's the same. So three new rules here, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. You got to practice these things. Let's end by showing you a motion of this example on Mathematica and also hint at uh, section 4.8, which I keep trying to get to, but never have had time. I'm not going to assign problems in section 4.8 at the moment. That'll come later in the semester, but I like introducing it early. Um, so let's go ahead and copy and paste this stuff again down here, but make changes. Let me make this now t divided by e to the t with a capital e and use parentheses like that. There are the derivatives. First and second derivative. I didn't find the second derivative by hand, but there it is. And yeah, this first derivative is the same as we got. We can factor out an e to the negative t and write it as e to the negative t times in parentheses one minus t. Probably best, I, I think it would be best to start this motion at time zero. So I'm going to change this negative four to a zero and change this negative four to a zero. And I think I'm gonna make this a smaller plot range in the y direction. Let's go, let's try negative um, three to three here instead of negative 15 to 40. And I better change this number too. Change this to a, a zero point, well, just point zero zero one say. So I changed the numbers in here and I also changed that number. Do what I did there after copying and pasting the other code and making sure to update this f of t here to look like that. This can now also represent a motion. It's a motion that goes up and then comes back down and never quite reaches zero, asymptotic to zero. The blue graph is still the position and I, I'm not sure why the green graph is doing what it's doing. That's weird. The blue graph is still the position. The goldish orangish graph is still the velocity. And the green graph is still the acceleration. And yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. I think I can fix it though. If I go back up here and do a comma right there and here do a plot range as well, but put all capital A L L. I think it won't do that anymore. Yeah, now the green graph doesn't do anything weird anymore. So this motion is just going upward, then turning around, coming downward. You start at position zero, but you never come back to position zero because that blue graph is just asymptotic to the horizontal axis. It never touches zero again. The velocity is positive at first, then becomes negative. So that orangish graph is positive at first. Then at time one becomes negative. The green graph, the acceleration is negative. And then evidently maybe slightly positive at a certain point, right around two or so. Hard to tell. So that's a particular kind of motion. I'm going to do, to end class today, I'm going to do one more thing in Mathematica. You do not have to do what I'm about to do. So only what we've done so far is something you should save as a PDF and upload in addition to your notes. Um, and again, if you want to cut out the graphs, it's fine if it makes the PDF smaller. Just want to see the code. Um, so I'm going to type something new in. I'm going to type, parametric plot, cos t comma sine t, or let's make a little t, comma sine t, t 
goes from zero to capital T, try to keep this as simple as possible. Plot range, I'm gonna type this as a 1.1. That's a little strange. I haven't done that kind of thing before. Then I'm gonna put this inside of manipulate and let capital T go from 0 0.001 to two pi. I got that pi to show up there by doing escape P escape. Remember escape E escape makes an epsilon. Uh, escape P escape makes a pi. You can also in this writing assistant, which you can get that through the palettes menu. Uh, you can find the symbol pi in here somewhere. If you click on this button here, it's somewhere in here. There's a pi right there. Okay, what's different? I'm using a different plotting command, parametric plot. I'm using trig functions, cosine and sine. What am I doing? Am I plotting both cosine and sine in the usual sense? The answer is no. This is a system of parametric equations. If you did do the reading in section 4.8, it represents x equals cosine of t and y equals sine of t. And you may remember from the reading or maybe a physics class that when you use trig functions like that, it's representing circular motion. like this at a constant speed. And you travel around, in this case, the unit circle in two pi units of time, so about 6.28 units of time, at a constant speed. What I'd like to do a little bit in addition to what we're doing in chapter three is talk about speed and distance traveled in this context. If I were to talk about velocity and position, it gets more complicated because then I'd have to bring vectors into play. And maybe we'll do that when we get to the end of chapter four a little bit, but I think I want to avoid vectors for the moment. Some of you know what vectors are, some of you don't. So we'll restrict ourselves to speed and distance here with this kind of motion rather than velocity and position. Okay, but this is, this is an X, Y plane. There's no T in these axes. T is just time that is going by as the motion happens. Parametric equations are very useful for describing motion in two dimensions or three dimensions for that matter. Okay, have a good day and uh, we'll see you after spring break. And again, no class on Friday, but I'll give you some videos to watch. There will be some homework to do as well.